What I need to do is record this. I'm definitely a creature of habit. <laughs> so when I start a new habit, it takes me... Um, it takes me a little while to break my old habit of not doing that thing. Continually trying to remind myself. I'm sure people understand what I'm trying to say. Anyways, welcome back to Blackburn News where everything is connected. Uh, I'm going to do a... Gonna do a long show again today, guys. Um, you know, we'll go probably an hour or it or more or less, somewhere around there. Um, we're gonna do a little super chat session at the end of the show. So if you want to super chat me a, a a question or a message to read aloud, you can do that on Rockfin. You can do that on YouTube, and you can also do that on PayPal. I have my PayPal app open, and you can also super chat me on PayPal, and uh, that way nobody takes a cut. It goes kind of pretty much directly to me, and um, I have my PayPal app open so I can read your chat or your comment or whatever later. Anyways... Why did I pick this? Why did I pick this uh, subject? This headline? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Rich Diana says DeSantis, baby Trump. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I just. I was reading a little something about bio. I was what I was reading was something on Twitter about biofuels how we were going to go green with biofuels. Airplanes are going to, um, airplanes are going to get green with biofuels. And obviously, um, let me see, hold on one second. Obviously, the biofuels that are made from, you know, uh, corn or trees or growing things. Um, oops. Obviously, those are not good at all. Maybe I should move this here. Can you guys see that? Hold on. This just looks really weird. Hold on, guys. Okay, there we go. That looks a little bit better, right? Um, no, that's not better enough. That's not better enough. Is that good English? But there, you know, one of the the possibles. One of the possibles is algae, um, how, you know, but there's some drawbacks to it. So let's look at the drawbacks. Making fuel out of algae could clean up dirty planes. This is out of Wired from a couple of years ago. The airline industry is one of the fastest growing contributors to climate change. Big time. But the cost of switching to biofuels is, fuels is holding off the prospect of cleaner air travel. The cost of switching to biofuels is holding off the prospect of cleaner air travel. Especially if, if those biofuels have to be grown or cultivated, it would take a lot of land to cultivate those biofuels. So there, it's just not going to, that's just not going to work because it's going to take way too many inputs and way too many resources. And we barely, we're running out of uh, farmable land as it is for just the food that we need to eat. Right? We're already running out of farmable land, so how are we going to farm uh, biofuels? Well, one way would be algae, I guess. While industries are racing to reduce their far carbon, farbon footprint, carbon footprint, one is lagging behind, aviation. Only one. <laughs> 
That's that's just a funny sentence. That whole sentence right there is just laughable. While industries are racing to reduce their carbon, we're racing, guys. We're we're doing it. We're well on the way to reducing our carbon footprint. That's what corporations are doing in industries all over the world. We're racing to lower our carbon footprint. Except for one. <laughs> all right. There may be only a few thousand planes in the air at any given moment. But, but together they produce 2% of all global carbon emissions. Only a few thousand planes in the air at any given moment. That's all. Just a few thousand. <laughs> uh... I mean, 2% sounds kind of small, right? It sounds rather small, but um, somehow that doesn't even really seem right to me. Um, and are, what are we counting in the 2%? Are we counting private jets? Are we counting... What are we counting? Things are only set to get worse with people traveling more often and further. By 2037, airlines could be carrying some 8.2 billion passengers. Twice as many as last year. 2037, huh? Okay. And we're going to double the billions of passengers. We're going to carry all the people of the planet in one year. This, together with an increase in freight travel, freight travel means aviation-related carbon emissions could triple by 2050. I, I feel like 2% is low, personally. I don't even think I, that doesn't even sound right to me, but we'll just assume that that's correct. I feel like there's some kind of uh, magical accounting in that 2%. But that's just me. Enter biofuels. A team of chemical engineers at University College London are looking to convert non recyclable household waste uh, oh, into methanol to produce a fuel that could power a long haul flight. One, A, long haul flight. <laughs> Without producing any CO2 emissions. How much trash do you need? Well, we got to make a lot of trash. Guys, we need more trash. We need more garbage because we need to make plain fuel. Their proposal landed them a 25 pound, 25,000 pound award from British Airways last week and a commitment from an airline to develop the airline to develop the solution further. We're, we're looking into it, guys. The plan would be uh, to be to build fuel plants near landfill sites across the UK to make production more economical and safe. A typical commercial plant would treat under 120,000 tons of waste every year, and that would produce a minimum of 22,800 tons of fuel. Whoa. Sounds like a lot of fuel. It says Massimiliano Matarossi. Matarazzi, a senior research fellow at the university. His team estimates the UK's entire waste could deliver 3.5 million tons of jet fuel an annually by 2050. That's awesome. That's a lot of jet fuel. <clears throat> uh, just a moment. I got to look at something. Just a moment. I got to look something up. Well, in 2019, uh, worldwide, the total consumption of commercial uh, of jet fuel was almost 100 billion gallons. 100 billion gallons of jet fuel. In case you were wondering. Uh, but that doesn't equal tons. I don't know what. How that how that equates to tons. This would be a neat solution for dealing with the country's waste disposal problem since landfills are space limited and pose a risk of leakage. Leakage. Just some leakage. And it would come in handy for the industry's climate change targets. First to cap carbon emissions at 2020 levels. 
meaning any growth after this year should only be achieved in a carbon neutral way through offsetting activities such as tree planting and second to have them by 2050 compared to 2005 values. Okay. So the industry has climate change targets. We're going to have, have our emissions by 2050. Okay. How do biofuels work? A flight entirely powered by fuels derived from sources such as detrofa plants, algae, or waste products would emit as much as 80% less carbon, so not 100% less carbon. Then ordinary fossil fuels, making for a promising solution to a low carbon future. It's challenging to electrify aviation using batteries or fuel cells, in part because of its weight restrictions on aircraft. So liquid biofuels have the potential to play a big role in greenhouse gas emissions reduction, says Corinne Scown. Scown. Wipe that scown off your face. It's like a scowl and a frown. Um, anyways, it's not that biofuels are total unknown in aviation, though. In 2008, Virgin Atlantic flew a Boeing 747 from London to Amsterdam with 20% of the oil in one of its four fuel tanks. 20% of the oil in one <laughs> of the fuel tanks made up of coconut and babasu oil. That's got to be sustainable. And in 2008, an Air New Zealand plane flew with a 50-50 mix of Jetrofa oil, oil and jet fuel. Oh, these test flights show that biofuels were suitable for aircraft and didn't require any modifications to existing engines. 2010, Airbus showed at the Berlin Air Show that it was possible to, possible to fly on algae-derived biofuels. That was a long time ago. Where's the biofuels, bro? But a decade and some 150,000 commercial flights later, biofuels still account for less, less than 0.1% of total aviation fuel consumption and are usually only used in combination with ordinary fossil fuels. Why? The main reason is that ethanol-based bio... Well, those, and those are wrong... Ethanol-based ethanol -based biofuels used in cars and motorcycles are not practical for aviation. They can trap water in aircraft fuel lines with freezes at high altitude. You don't want to be in that plane. Also, investing in the development and production of plant-based biofuels comes with a hefty price tag. <clears throat> the International Civil a Aviation Organization estimates that a complete replacement with biofuels would require around 170 large biorefineries. A complete replacement with biofuels would require around 170 large biorefineries to be built every year from 2020 to 2050 at a cost of 11 billion pounds to 46 billion pounds per year. Is each one cost that or all of them cost that? This could also spark off a public and political controversy due to concerns over land grabs and food security. Big problems with biofuels. Big, big problems. That is 170 biorefineries built every year from 2020 to 2050. We got it, guys. We got it in the bag. Sorry if that was loud. We don't want to compete with agricultural activity. So... To grow algae, one needs fresh water. Oh, you need fresh water. You need fresh water to grow the algae. <laughs> okay, so we already are in a freshwater emergency. Again, because humans are drinking up all the water, sucking it up. I drink your milkshake. I drink of your fresh water. There's been a huge interest in alternative fuels by the big players. Aircraft manufacturers and oper operators have their CO2 emission reductions clear in sight, but they don't have the drive for investment because they need to finance their running operations and then find alternative money to support research in that direction. Oh. Yeah. So, again, just highlighting the problems with trying to green up 
the airline industry, why not not fly? Why not not fly? That's my that's my new slogan. <clears throat> my new go green slogan, why not not fly? Um and then to underscore this a wee a wee bit. The Pentagon paid for green jet fuel and it cost $150 a gallon. <laughs> if you know how much uh, fuel these planes burn through, like thousands of gallons of jet fuel, like on one, one flight, $150 per gallon, when usually uh, regular fuel is $3 per gallon, right? So that could be a little bit costly. Probably not going to happen. In case you were confused about the fallacy, I mean, and this is not, you know, when they said like, oh, we're just, you know, one industry is lagging far behind these other corporations and we're going green. They all face these issues and these problems and, you know, they're not going to green up. Their, their, all the supply chains rely on fossil fuels as of right now. Even though some people out there are like living in a fantasy world of like, yeah, some of those, some of those uh, tractors we use for mining are electric. Some of those, some of the trucks we use to deliver oil run on batteries. No, they don't. At least not yet. They they don't. <laughs> um. Whatever. And did I get a super chat? I did. Jay Brandt, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you. You are the coolest. You are the coolest. Why does my Rockfin keep on doing this? It's so weird. Stop. I'm already live, sir. Rockfin. I've been live. I'm alive. Stop it. Oh, that's glitchy. Oh, well. Maybe it's just a, a bit of a glitch. Okay, Rockfin. Maybe I need to refresh. Uh, anyways, what's up, people of Rockfin? Hello, hello. Kevin Chanholzer says, how about... People just stop flying. Planes are 100% a luxury, not needed. Right. You're right. But, you know, human beings have been told for, you know, decades upon decades upon, you know, at least half a century, if not more. I mean, way more than half a century that, you know, flying in planes is romantic and, you know, and now it's like totally doable and affordable. Like everybody, almost everybody I know. Everybody I see on Instagram, everybody I see on social media is just like, like, oh, I, you know, I can't wait to travel. I just want to travel. I love traveling. Traveling is the coolest. Traveling is the best. We love to travel. Let's fly. Let's fly some more. Let's, you know, we're going on vacation. Here we go. I mean, it's just the propaganda has been completely successful because everybody's minds are com are totally sold on, uh, you know, can't wait to, you know, I, I'm, I'm working to travel, right? You know, I can't wait to stop working this job so I can go travel. Um, if you could do one thing with your life, what would it be? Travel all the time, <laughs> you know? So unless you're traveling by bicycle or on, on donkey, uh, your travel is probably destroying the planet. Just, just letting you know, I know that's really, nobody wants to hear that. But they earn the luxury, exactly, Jay Thadcast. Nobody wants to hear that, that your travel is destroying the planet. That if you really cared about the planet, if you really wanted to align yourself with nature, you wouldn't get in that plane. You would do everything in your power to resist getting in that plane. That's, that's what you would do. Well, there's more to cover, so let's continue. 
more to talk about. Um, just wanted to kind of touch on this uh, thread by Ben C. Ben C does a lot of, I really like, uh, I follow Ben C on Twitter. And he has just a ton of information, good information to think about, consider. This from yesterday. We're heading for a 1.8 to 1.9 C using a, a 1750. Uh, we're heading for 1.8 to 1.9 C using a 1750 baseline by the 2030s. Or even using an 1850 baseline. So 2 C by 2034. What, okay, what's, what do you guys think about that? 2C by 2034. Is that super optimistic? You think we hit 2C by 2030? 2020. Do I hear 2025? Anybody? I don't know. 2C, 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 2027, 2028, 2025. Sold. Sold to the IPCC. Um. Anyways, he goes on to say global warming is happening faster than at almost any other time there has been animal life on Earth. True. We must end deforestation immediately slash carbon emissions. Sure. This is an ecological crisis caused by economic growth. We need a new system. Indeed. That new, new system doesn't have planes in it. <laughs> Sorry, let me news flash. That new system doesn't also doesn't have cars in it either. That new system is very local and very old school. At least in, at least until we figure out which technologies are not going to destroy the earth wholesale. Which we never do, right? Whenever we make something new, whenever we build something new, we make something new. Oh, new technology, new tech, new tech, new tech. We just like go ahead and we're just like it's cool, we're going to do it. Yeah, we might think about how it impacts the environment or the future of the planet or the endocrine systems of living beings. We might. We'll do that later after it's already been out there for a couple of decades. It'll be fine. He goes on to say, it doesn't look like the absolute decoupling of GDP from the total use of natural resources is possible. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. It doesn't look like, meaning it is not possible. So if you can't decouple it from natural, uh, the use of natural resources, what do you got to do? You got to get rid of the GDP. You got to get rid of the whole thing that the GDP is all about. That's what it's all about. Because it's a bunch of hokey pokey. That's what it's all about. Only immediate emergency system change could prevent what might be termed total catastrophe, not least because the expanding mass extinction event is due in large part to for-profit industrial agriculture, fishing, logging, etc., which are annihilating, annihilating habitats. How do we stop doing that? How do we stop doing that? When the whole world is telling everyone else in the entire, on the, the whole world, half the whole world is telling the other half of the whole world, you got to raise your standard of living. You need more stuff in your life. You need to get in, you know, your economy strong. Blah, 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 blah. Let's move on. Well, so a bit of good news in the, in the, in the, deluge the avalanche of bad news awesome news fracking banned in the delaware river basin more more than thirteen thousand square miles of land go greens thinks one day all of usa will ban fracking hopefully that's not in 2038 or 2045 <laughs> and i you know i don't again i don't this is uh you know, sure, this is good news. And the pessimist in me doesn't think that this is going to hold for very long. 
um, especially since fracking is, you know, so widely accepted, such a widely accepted practice. But anyways, fracking was banned in the Delaware River Basin on Thursday after a group of regional governors voted to prohibit the practice across the basin's more than 13,000 square miles of land. Funny, I didn't hear anything about this. There was no news about this. I didn't see any news stories about this. This is like a week or two ago, a couple weeks ago. A resolution passed by the Delaware River Basin Commission, made up of the governors of New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey, as well as the North Atlantic Division Engineer of the Army Corps of Engineers, banned hydraulic fracking throughout the basin, which includes land across the four states. Text of the resolution passed Thursday argued that fracking presents risks, vulnerabilities, and impacts to surface and groundwater resources in the Delaware River Basin. The Delaware River is a major waterway along the east coast of originating, originating in the New York's Catskill Mountains and spilling into the Atlantic in the Delaware Bay, which borders Delaware and New Jersey. All right. Well, well, good for them. Let's hope this holds. You know, I, I don't want to see any news, and I don't doubt that I might actually see this news. You know, a couple months from now. Oh, that decision was overturned by Blobbity Blue. After pressure from investors, lawmakers decided to rescind this decision to protect the Delaware Basin. I would totally expect to see that in the next few months. Um, I urge you all to keep your eyes out for said news story. This is from Jim Baird. University of Iowa reports links to climate change with the record flooding of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers in 2019. Do you think so? Iowa City, Iowa, University of Iowa report links climate change with the record flooding of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers at waterlogged Iowa in the spring of 2019. Gabriel Villarini, UI professor of civil and environmental engineering and lead author of the report, says weather phenomena he calls Midwest water hose <laughs> events are responsible. With a water hose, he says there's a concentrated amount of water affecting a specific location. Um, those water hose events bring moisture from the Gulf to the Midwest as heavy rainfall, which he says was responsible for more than 70% of the total precipitation across most of the central U.S during the first half of the 2019. The UI report says rising greenhouse gas concentrations caused by human activity are bringing more heavy rainfall events tied to the Midwest water hose. And they're beyond what can be attributed to natural changes to the climate. So there you go. <clears throat> there you go. <clears throat> Real, oh, uh, yeah, mm hmm, yep, indeed. All right. Why? 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 Rockfin <clears throat> glitching out on me. J Thadcast says 2030 <laughs> is his guess. 2C. Oh, you said, oh, wait, 3C. <laughs> um, hold on one second, guys. One second. All right. <clears throat> Let's get some more people on Rockfin, R O K F I N dot com. Please follow me on Rockfin, R O K F I N dot com. 
which is ad free. <clears throat> and where this live stream will be after this is over, I'm going to, this live stream will go private on YouTube and you can watch it on Rockfin after that. <laughs> no, Raza, no, <laughs> no. Um, all right. Oh, lastly, so <clears throat> in this segment of the show, this is super random, but you know, it actually, to me, indicates that a, that a simpler way of life, <clears throat> a non- uh, westernized or non-Americanized, um, hyper-consumerish way of life is a better life. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but this is an interesting article in the Atlantic. There's a better way to parent, less yelling, less praise. Um, but they just, this woman, I guess, studied parenting um, around the world and in, in, uh, indigenous communities. And basically her conclusion was that, um, our, our, our hyper, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, uh, the, the way that we just kind of, uh, indulge children in the West with you know whatever they want anything they want and you know praise them all the time she said it's not an effective way to parent <laughs> and it actually leads to uh behavioral and emotional problems and but this is the most interesting part she was like throw away all your toys if you're a parent throw away most of your kids toys they don't need them they're they're getting in the way of uh and i i've known this for years actually like just the the the, the, <laughs> the onslaught of toys, even though there's an onslaught of toys in my daughter's room, but I mean the onslaught is just it's just o over the top. She also said, "Don't take your kids to uh, theme parks." Um. Anyways, basically reject Americanized parenting styles uh, is the way to way to do it. And adopt more indigenous parenting styles. And that, you know, kind of holds true for like everything else. <laughs> like if we don't want to, if we don't want to destroy the planet, we should probably adopt more indigenous ways of living. Reject uh, westernized, hyper-consumerized ways of living. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people on this channel are already hip to that. Just putting that out there. It's an interesting aside. <clears throat> 